Hey, coaches, I had a great conversation with Justin Dottavio, who is a high school coach that moved to Oregon last summer, uh, where I live, and sadly is moving back to the East Coast right now as, as we speak. And I wanted to follow up with him on some stuff he's produced relating to running uh, the RPO or run pass option off of the wing T belly play. And this is primarily from a pistol or shotgun look. So I spent some time interviewing him and going through some of the finer points, particularly as it might relate to installing this as a youth team. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, leave some comments below and I'll see you soon. Take care. Um, when I think about in a wing T offense, like what's What's kind of a prime target for thick and RPO? It's like belly is where you start. And it's for especially belly from like pistol because the relationship of the quarterback with what he's going to be doing in terms of his footwork, his vision kind of being able to look around. And I'm contrasting that with maybe, uh, you know, if you're going to run buck sweep where he's going to turn his back to the line of scrimmage or if you're under center. Um, I think a lot of these, a lot of the RPOs are going to be difficult from there. So my focus with what Brian and I've talked about for this season is we're going to experiment with this, but we're going to, we're going to kind of hang our hat on, uh, an RPO around kind of a pistol belly. And so obviously what you've done is, is a good match for that. Um, was that kind of, when you think about when you started doing some of this, what, what was your thinking around kind of where it made sense to incorporate this at the start? Was it kind of that same mentality or was there some other, some other reason? Um, we got, you know, when I got to Cornerstone, uh, you know, they, they were very far behind, obviously, on everything. But um, we didn't have a lot of talent. And so it would have, if I had thought about had a, kind of put the um, wing T into like a shotgun type thing and give us this, we would have been a lot better the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, the third year I was there, we were just so, so, so young. And we tried to run the same thing we ran the year before when we were a little more senior loaded. And it, it just was, you know, running a typical 11 personnel spread zone based, it, it didn't work. And it was right. like, the square peg round hole thing. We're just trying to do something that ain't going to work and a quarterback wouldn't run. And so what's the point? And even though he, he could have, but he wouldn't. And, you know, I don't know what was going on there, but, um, if dad told him just to get down and slide all the time, it was like fourth and three slid after getting a yard one time and he could have easily just ran right into the end zone. It was mm -hmm. nuts. Uh, we lost the game <laughs> that on that play, basically. Um, you know, it was, it, it was, the thought process of like, all right, well, I've got to do something if this kid's not going to run. And our offensive line's not great. They're really good at pass protection, but they're not great at run, you know, run blocking. And what are we going to do? Well, let's get the angle aspect of the wing T, but we don't want to get trapped into a run because everyone in that league was just about throwing a bunch of guys at line of scrimmage and blitzing and rushing most of them up, you know, just trying to overload the gaps. Yeah. The guy could never coach above 1A football, 2A football. But, he, you know, it was like when you play Little League Baseball, a guy just steals everybody all the time. Right. Everybody steal, you know, and you just hope the catcher can't make the throw to third or whatever. Like one of those guys. You're not teaching anyone baseball when you do that. Right. You're right. just teaching guys how to win some stupid league championship, and then they go to high school and they're laughed at. So it's the same aspect of when the kid right. goes to college, he's going to get laughed at. Good for you. You went, you know, five and four in independent football. But – we needed something to kind of offset that a little bit. And so if we were able to throw the quick slant or the bubble, um, that was going to be beneficial. We started doing the RPO stuff in 2012 right away because the quarterback I had kind of did it in Denmark because they play uh, eight man. And even though it's sort of college rules, um, they incorporated a lot of that with, with having less – lineman because it just made more sense i guess mm -hmm. so he was always kind of reading the the one defensive lineman that was out there and then he'd start to run down field he'd have the guy he could throw the, the quick little now to or he'd just turn up and run okay because he okay. couldn't throw very well 
So it was throw the little quick screen as you're running at the guy, kind of like, you know, just sprinting and run, throw it. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, kind of Rich Rodriguez did that. And then, so we had him do that. You know, we would run a play action sometimes and do it. And then it would just be that screen between the, the slot and him. And they'd kind of play off of each other and sort of triple option it sometimes. And he was really good at it. And so that's where we started doing that. And then the next year, we were doing it more. He had torn his knee up but was still playing on it with a brace. So he couldn't run as much at, at all times. So he got a little better. They got a little worse. But um, we had to figure out kind of an alternative to that. So then we started doing more like the old – um Houston Cougars uh, run and shoot. If you're mm-hmm. uncovered, take the one step slant, just turn, catch it, and he's just going to throw it to you. You better look. You know, right. even if you uh, if you had a vert, you had a wheel route. You know, if you're uncovered, just take the step and go. And they weren't really saying much to each other. We as the coaches were yelling out either Houston or Cougar, right? And you knew to take the step and catch, but those two didn't communicate. So that worked for us pretty well. But we knew we needed to fix it. Did a lot of research. So in 2013 in the spring going – or I guess 14 going into the 14 fall, we started running it more often. And by the time 15 rolled around, we were much more talented even though it was all the same kids. They just weren't 14 anymore. Mm-hmm. Playing with a freshman – like a JV against varsities, and we still were like four touchdowns and going five and five. Right. And, you know, But it was always that one thing. He slid that time, cost us one game. Like we were just not all the way there, but it really made sense. I thought the kid was never going to run, so the best thing to do was get the ball out of his hands. If he's handing off in a wing team, we needed the angles. We had some smaller linemen. Uh, we had some guys who could pull. So a lot of that just made sense uh, cool. to us to be able to do. So when you, when you think about your approach, and this is mostly with like how you coach the quarterbacks, and you – as we go through this, we'll talk about the pre and post snap side of things. Which, where do you th- is the emphasis pre snap? Is that the main thing they're looking for? Is that what you're coaching up, or would you say it's more balance? Where where's the where's the emphasis? Well, like when I install the offense, in either way, is it um, it doesn't matter if it's going to be more of the pistol and T style, which we still incorporate no matter what, because I like belly, obviously, enough to have wanted to make this whole thing. But, um, And I really like Buck Sweep. We changed the way we were going to do Buck Sweep this year at Wilmina, um, and so it was going to be a little bit different. But um, I like running some trap. I like running some belly. Obviously, power is really a wing T play deep down. Um, so I want to keep those things, even if the focus is going to be more on um, – a zone scheme. So mm-hmm. the way that I install it is to have um, the quarterback, let's say your first play is just going to be a regular lead play, kind of like a zone lead. Um, 20 personnel are going to run zone lead. I'm going to make sure that the only read he has to make would be the backside slant or give it and then fake and get out of the way. Because you want to give him in a scrimmagey setting the least amount to think about possible. So it's really easy to make it the backside pre-snap read. Okay, I'm going to you know mm-hmm. count my box. What's my shell? Um, where's my flat defender? What's my corner leverage? If I'm getting outside corner leverage and one high, I'm throwing the slant every time or somebody's lost their mind. So it's just something easy for him to see. Okay, the corner is um, – you know, giving outside leverage. Okay, the corners, you know, just wherever they are in relation to that. Like, where, what am I getting out of out of that um, alignment? So that's what I want him to do. I want him to count the, the shell. I want him to count the box. If the box is seven, it's an either or. If the box is eight plus, you've got to throw, right? And mm-hmm. if, the box, if the box is going to be five or six um, – then you're on, you know, you're, you're going to run. I mean, if you can't run against the six man box, that's your problem. What are your, um, how do you teach a quarterback to read the box? Um, I gave him this almost exact same thing. I have a manual and I hand it, I give it to him and it's got a huddle cut up deal with it. Um, the one that we used was a lot more zone, um, because the game that I based it on, uh, they just left us 
kind of like we ran inside zone 700 times in a row and mm-hmm. you know 52 to nothing or something or 52 to six or something you know like it was i never changed the play because why would you you know like right. if it works it works so we just left with the the same place so i kind of when i came up here i made that manual for the quarterback and it was also for the other coaches because i found that um at times what we think everybody's heard of they haven't and i just assume since i've been talking about rpo since 2012 i'm not any further along than anybody else and it turned out i guess for some people i was and so i thought okay well if you don't know what i'm talking about then um I'll make this manual and I'll tell you everything I know and I'll same thing with the screenshot. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. it is a lot of this is just copied and pasted from the other, um, presentation, um, the RPO manual, uh, which probably could be touched up. But, um, so when you like looking at the photo that we have here from your mm -hmm. pre-snap reads, um, obviously the two inside linebackers and the three down linemen, easy to count, Where's your what's what kind of thresholding do you teach the quarterback when he's going to look at those outside linebackers and make a choice of whether they're in or out? How do you teach that? I think where's his hips pointing? So the guy mm-hmm. there on the left, I circled him as a flat defender for that side of the field, then the flat defender there. His you know, where is hips? The guy on the left he can't make a play on a bubble. Now, the bubble's not to that side, but he couldn't do it because he's going to have to turn his entire mm-hmm. hips and run. Yeah. The guy on the other side, um, yeah, him. He's a little more he, balanced. Yeah, he's a little more balanced. It's harder to tell where he's at, but his di- like distance apart is so far um, that I don't, I don't see how he's going to get there and that safety's too deep. Right. So if you do everything you're supposed to do, you should be able to block that guy and, or at least outrun him. Right. Um, so your count yeah. here would be six or seven, but either way you're kind of in that threshold of, um, you know, let's look, let's look at the specific leverage of the pass defenders and make a call off that. Yeah, it really starts getting into leverage. Those corners – um, now, and that team was the state uh, champion the year before, and they made the semifinals that year that we played them. So, we you also have to look at how fast are those corners. They're a lot mm-hmm. faster than our guys. So, with them being super fast dudes, uh, I don't. I feel like they're going to be able to jump down in a slant and kind of knock you in the right. mouth. Um, right. We should be able to run on that front. I mean, you have three down linemen. That end at the top of the screen is way wide. If you can't run on that, there's no point in. Oh, right there. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. down tackle. Or yeah, that's a that's that's a pretty good setup for running belly right there. Yeah, exactly. And and what we were teaching our kids against them is that right ta- there that right tackle is gonna should through block that guy and the guard should kick him out. Okay. With um, if that guy was lined up in a four or not a five. Um, that tackle would take him on base block and, and our guard would actually come up and around and get that, uh, um, fold, fold for him. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. We have him skip pull, come around and try to find somebody he could hit square in the chest because really the guy shouldn't make the play anyway. Yeah. But they were so fast Yeah. that that guy might've actually from that spot made a play on belly because they were another level of athletic. So I don't think we need to go into this specifically. Although I do, there's a question that's going to come up. Let's and and uh, and this is a chance for you to give some quick advice to maybe a middle school level coach. Um, my understanding is that you're with nothing else. If you if you're let's say you're running tempo and you're you know you're in this twenty personnel look. You know, with both both ends spread out and a slot on one side, and you call and you're going to run belly. What we've seen around um, kind of the the um, slant, the stalk bubble on one side and the slant on the other. That's your that's your baseline. That's what's obvious. What's going to be there with no other tags or calls. Yeah. So yeah, and we've gone. Um, the receivers I had at Cornerstone were very seasoned, and so they could actually run a slant 
and then they didn't get the ball, they would turn up and start blocking. Mm -hmm. But they were very, uh, you know, very seasoned players. You know, if they were a junior, they'd been playing varsity since eighth grade. So they had had all that time to learn, um, you know, against some pretty good competition. Right. Here, um, we were not ready for that. So we alternated to stock and bubble. Okay. Because we were just whiffing completely on that block and getting guys killed in practice. So before we ever hit a game, we changed it to stock and bubble. And so, yeah, if you're on the one receiver side, you had the slant, and then it slant to stock. You, you don't get the ball. You turn up field and start blocking the first most dangerous man. And then it's stock and, and bubble. If you know, And it, he's going to block whichever guy's closest. Again, most gotcha. dangerous stuff. If the corner's right on top of him, block the easy guy. If the up safety or whomever, outside line, whatever you want to call him, is standing up press, you're going to block kind of cross block him and come back around. So I think I I think I understand what you said, but I want to repeat it back to you. So on the bubble side with at Willamina, you simplified and said if you're if you're the X on the bubble side, you're just gonna stalk. Um, yeah. don't, don't even think about doing a slant to stalk. Nope. Correct. And then on the slant side, we still ran that. And I still ran the slant to stock drill that I like because you were going to wind up being the solo receiver depending on form age. Right, right. They need to be ready for both. And that was what I saw right here. Your drills for RPO and belly. Um, yeah, I like the uh, – yeah, that first one is kind of that slant to stock, um, mm -hmm. kind of a no ball drill there. And then yeah, running it with no ball because you don't want them to worry about catching it and all the stuff mm -hmm. receiver coaches like to do, like push-ups and all that. I'd rather see you attack the slant. And I'll leave the cones out and let them run the cones and then have that shield guy so you're not getting banged up too much. And you're able to, to turn. You have to look at me. I'm going to pump or I'm going to hand off. If I hand off, the guy whips his head around, gets his butt low and blocks and hits that shield nice and square. If – um if I do the throw, he catches the ball, and then he has to work on catching it and then avoiding that shield guy at all possible. So he has to get way out and avoid that shield guy and make a run. So what? Um, walk me through how you would coach a receiver on that on that release and the footwork for the slant to stalk. Um, I mean, you know, you, you run slant really. And then yeah. from there, uh, it, it, to me – He's got to, and in the way that we do our speed camp, the kids understand is we call it short cycle. So it's going to be your shoulders are going to rotate as fast as possible. So your head gets back around. You're going to rotate. And it's three very choppy steps to explode, and then you need to get up under. So at that point, it's all about coming to balance, getting up under and fitting a guy up, just like your blocking circuit. Hopefully everybody teaches a blocking circuit where – you're working from your knees and you teach the punch and hip extension and then you get them on their feet and you kind of like a baseball swing, one, two, three. You, I kind of clap through the steps. It's right, left, and punch. So now you're, you know, you're able to slowly see he's taking his right step, left, and punch. Where are your fingers? Where are your thumbs? Um, you know, we do day one blocking fundamentals every offensive day because A, um, what do you call it, liability – Mm -hmm. I don't want somebody saying that, well, he played quarterback, he never learned how to block, uh, you, you know, whatever he handed off, he's running on the field and he just ducks his head and hits into somebody, you know, you don't want, you don't want him to do that, and at the same time, you don't want to get blamed when somebody does something dumb, but um, also, everybody does kind of wind up blocking, and especially in small school levels, um, I remember being on some some Pop Warner teams where a kid went from guard to fullback to quarterback, <laughs> like, I even had a couple freshman teams like that where we had a kid, you know, work his way from fullback in a game. Well, a kid got hurt. He had to play guard. Next week, the guard's back. Now the fullback series back, you know, just crazy amount of right. moving around. So you want everybody to learn everything. Yep. And, uh, you know, I don't think anybody's above learning tackling and blocking. I I agree. And if you're, if you're a wing T coach and you're running counter crisscross – you might need your quarterback to uh, block anyway, right? And and in the running, almost anything we run, the quarterback winds up. I hope he goes downfield and tries to block somebody if it springs from you know eight yeah. more. 
Yeah. You hope he's not just watching and kind of trotting downfield. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's – so let's – talk about and you probably had to deal with some of this last season kind of coming in with a a newer program to you and a smaller program so you've got an inexperienced quarterback so maybe a young kid um, who hasn't done this sort of thing before how do you how do you simplify this um, and set him up for success and confidence in making these these decisions um, I think by the way that you install it, I think by starting off with um, with a pre-snap read only and no, you know, run mesh, just mm-hmm. give, you know, give, and then you can work the fake throw. So if all he's reading is that slant, that's just a leverage play. Mm-hmm. So, okay, is he outside, head up, or inside? If he's outside, throw it. If he's head up or inside, it's off. Right. Um, don't get too tricky with it at first. Just let it be very simple. Um, and you know, you, you do start off with, okay, let's count the box. What do you got? Boom. Okay. That's what I have. Um, okay. Count the shell. Well, it's too high. I got too high too. It benefits you in smaller schools too, because the the quarterback also plays defense. Mm -hmm. And so our quarterback here is also our weak side linebacker. Um, and so he knows what the box is and a too high shell and he's playing in our defense. And I believe those two weeks at camp are you against you. So that you're right. constantly just learning your own stuff. Right. You're not right. scout anybody or throwing random stuff. I, I want you to learn when you're playing scout defense, it's our defense. When you're playing scout offense, it's our offense. So gotcha. that makes it gotcha. really easy for him as well. But having um, yeah, just the, the, the that kind of backside pre snap. So that once he catches, especially with belly, once he catches the ball, takes his two horizontal steps, he's stepping down, and he rides the belly. That way, now he doesn't have his back is so turned to that he knows he can't even look at it. There's no temptation yep. to throw it because it's away from him. Right. Now, the other side there towards the belly um, is going to be stock and bubble. We've told him that's off for now. Okay, you're not allowed to throw. So it gives him just one guy to read left we told him they're gonna run it but it's off on the other side i want you to look to that and then step step ride release and he fakes out like it's gonna be option gotcha so so smart he pulled the ball and ran belly option like belly keep i guess you could say without uh us ever saying a word just one day he just pulled ran i was like oh well yeah i guess you have a 395 gpa bud you're a little smarter than the coach yeah so um, post snap, and let's talk about belly specifically on play side. Especially when you're starting, you you never want him looking back to the backside after the snap. No, his shoulders are turned. It, the, my rule of thumb is wherever your shoulders and eyes are going to be. If it was, mm-hmm. you know, if it was zone, it would be to that backside because you're looking at the defensive end. Yep. When it becomes belly, it's going to be play side, play side, play side. Your shoulder. Yep. I mean, if you're taking it at a pistol, you're really taking that hard. I call it belly mesh. Your step, step, and ride, and you've like yeah. got up, over, and any of those horizontal steps yeah. to be able to get closer to the B gap and hit that thing 100 miles an hour. Um, because there isn't a lot of time from when the ball is is kind of snapped to when you have to be through that hole. Um, I want to say, I mean, Belly had some pretty good yardage for us there at CCA. We were just very careful about um, when we ran it mm-hmm. because, you know, it was, it was a it, it start. You know, it was a very good play for us to get five yards on if we only ran it once in a while. Right. As soon as we started running it too much, people were jumping all over it and, and just you know they were just saying, okay, we'll just put a guy in each one of those gaps to the two back you know, to the up back side, and we're just gonna you know. We'll bring four to that side, and we know exactly that you're not throwing that bubble, and you know, right? And we had to really incorporate throwing the bubble out of that. Or did you run? Uh, did you run a tackle trap or any kind of counter off that? Uh, we out of that look, we did run um, a guard trap. Okay. And was that to the uh, to the halfback? Um, no, we gave it to the that to was, the that was still still the tailback. So the so the H is going to come straight up field though, just like he would on belly straight yep. ahead because yep. he's going to replace the guard. Yep. 
and we're just going to step back this way. Yeah. You know, we can give it to him, place like H back side, and let him come the other way. Okay. And that way, it looks like we're all flowing to the right, and then he bows back over. Especially as guys start teaching more backfield read instead of guard read. Right. As soon as they started telling kids, follow don't the read. halfback, right? <laughs> yeah, follow the fullback. All right, follow the H back then, right. you know. Yep. Go ahead, be my guest. Yep. We'll let him fill that gap, and you'll have your linebackers in there, and it'll all. And trap was another one. If we ran it in frequently, it was two times a quarter or something like that. Man, it. Was, I mean, we had you know a trap play go for forty something yards with a guy that averaged two yards a run the year before because we were really selective about when we ran certain mm-hmm. parts. Of, you know, when we faked the jet and ran the trap. So you know, we wouldn't. We hardly ever even ran jet. But if you fake a jet and run a trap. They all run. Everybody runs, you know, even if mm-hmm. you never run jet sweep. There's games where we never ran jet sweep once, and we just ran the trap, and we still got, you know, six, seven yards on it. Yeah. All right. I think one of the last things I want to talk about is the how you approach kind of the full Skelly um, teaching progression. And, and this is kind of geared towards early season as you first start installing – do you have have you like and I'm 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 overlaying this with how we've we're approaching our quick game installation mm-hmm. this year, where we we are going to ask the quarterback to make a field side choice pre snap, you know left or right, and then just commit to that and then go through his read progression. But we're gonna our plan for installing that is that when we're installing, we're going to tell him which side to go. So he's not really deciding yet. And we might even manipulate the defense a little bit to reinforce like why that was the better side. Do you do anything like that as you're installing and scripting out an RPO Skelly? Um, How do you manipulate the defense? How do you kind of reinforce decision-making for the quarterback when you're doing this? I use scout cards. And so the defensive coordinator is on the other side. He huddles him up, shows him the scout card, and I will have front side, mm-hmm. maybe one hole, like kind of like this picture shows. Front, that's our, our in our my defense. That's the robber look. We're going to put that Sam linebacker up in the number two space. Corner plays off inside. This free safety plays the apex, and then on the other side we're just playing base quarters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That gives the quarterback two entirely different things to look at on it on that play. Right. So I might show it like that, um, and, and if it's you know if we're repping belly, he's only looking you know to the front side. Right. Post snap, but pre snap, that's a pretty good look right there, just to grab the ball and throw. Right. So you as the, so you got the defensive, um, your your guy running scout D doing that, and obviously you have your own script, so you mm-hmm. know what he's going to do. Do you have? Have you also written down, at least for yourself, what you would expect him to do, so that you're evaluating? Or is that pretty? You're kind of more real time, automatic. You can just look at it yourself and then give him feedback as he goes. I'd never thought about uh, writing down what I expect him to do. It's a great idea. Um, it just never crossed my mind. Uh, I, I guess I've been doing it more when I look at the sheet and I go, okay, I kind of know about what he's going to do. We don't give a, you know, there's not a thousand right. looks because right. it is high school. Right. 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 Uh, same as eighth grade. I mean, there, yeah. it's the same thing. So there's, yeah. there's not a ton of stuff to look at, I guess. There, we there, do and you're standing, right. you're standing behind the guy. You're looking at what he's looking. Even yeah. if you, even if you planned it out, the odds that the scout defense is going to line up exactly like you wanted them to anyway, is probably pretty slim. I'm sure pretty they get slim. better with that as they go, but. We, you know, and that's funny is you start getting guys that, that are like scout experts. Um, yeah. You know, at CCA, because I was there for five years, uh, we had guys that they knew when scout came around, that was their chance to really prove how much playing time they were going to get in the game. But they were like scout pros. You know, they could run a scout offense. Yeah. And they didn't need any help at all. You know, it was, oh, I've seen, and I would always overly, um, label a scout card so they know this is this formation us and we always use our verbiage of the play so that's right. just lead, just run lead you know like if, instead of iso we're calling it lead stuff like that right so we just used our verbiage um and that was really beneficial to us too is our formation names our verbiage 
Um, and I think they really grew from that. Uh, yeah, and, and the number one thing to do is get everybody out of the defensive side. A lot of those guys love to hang out back there. Yeah. And I don't know. They, it, like, I don't know how you're not worried about getting a ball thrown at your head because I yeah. personally, as a correct, would have hit you with one. Oh, God. But, or just getting – I know that happened to me in a special teams practice one day where uh, I, got, I got totally – ear hold blindsided in the back because um, I was just it was my own fault I did not blame the player because I I was lurking where I shouldn't be lurking and it only takes one or two times of that happening where you realize get out of the play <laughs> especially when the kids are running 100 miles an hour and they're like he's not looking no no you know, if I'm running this way but I've got my eye over here and bam I just run right into you I yeah. mean <laughs> it happens to the refs god knows so the I guess the last question is the variety in your RPOs. Did you just tag these? So would you say something like, you know, belly snag was a pretty simple calls that you used for that? Or was it something? Yes. something yeah. uh, okay. I believe in very simple. Uh, after having worked um, English language learning in ESOL, yeah. um, you learn that this is another language. So you're speaking, yeah. like when I worked with the Haitian Creole kids, at least Spanish, my parents speak it. I'm from Miami and Orlando. I can speak some Spanish, not great or anything, but you know, yeah, I can, I can translate that, but it's so slow. Yeah. So I think it's okay. I grew up in a, in a household and yeah, a city where it's almost the first language and all that. And still it's very slow for me to translate. Well, football is not these kids first language. Yeah. And so you've got to make sure like when we run slant, it slant, slant, it slant, it slant. And that way, um, there's not thunder and lightning or 52 and 51. Like, I don't want the kid to think of the number. So I want him to go, oh, I run a slant. Good. Oh, I run a um, hitch. Okay, hitch is a hitch is a hitch. Um, I mean, things obviously have to get a little bit more hokey, but then you figure out a way to explain them to people. Um, You know, why is it snag? Why is it this? Why is it that? I always try to come up with a mnemonic device. So having taught kids that I had to teach them like, yes, no, you know, how to say very basic things and what they meant. Um, it just translated to me to football. So, uh, yeah, everything is very simple. Um, at CCA, when we ran something that was in our wing T playbook, it was the name of the play in the direction. So belly was belly, right? Yeah. Like it was going to the right. Um, we got more into one word association here for everything. And so belly right would be Bart because mm-hmm. B for belly R and then bell was the, was the left version. Cause there's an L in the middle of it. It starts yep. with the B. Yep. Lee is Laura and Lily. Um, powers prong and plug. Mm-hmm. So very buck sweep is a uh, Brett and bill. Um, just very simple. Did you let the players come up with those names or was that a coach thing? That was a coach thing. Um, it had just been – like most of them had been around for so long. I was, I'm was i always afraid I'm not going to be able to remember anything. Mm-hmm. So it's like uh, instinctual memory for me. So when I'm teaching it, it's just like that, um, which you know is why it's very important uh, to – sometimes to give coaches a chance to adjust some things. So for instance um, – I had a guy come in. He was going to be an offensive coordinator. But, you know, at Cornerstone, I was never very comfortable with the idea of someone staying longer than a couple weeks mm-hmm. because you get in spring, these guys would come over. They'd see, oh, wow, it's 22 kids in a dirt lot um, and the water's hot. You know, we don't even have ice. And <laughs> you know, they'd get that aspect of it. They didn't have a Gatorade waiting for them when they got back in a cliff bar or something. So it was. You know, I gave you a T-shirt that was already worn by the last guy. It was very <laughs> tough for some guys to go from a big level down to down to you know the, the smaller guys. But um, and so I did institute. We're not really going to change much because I don't trust that you'll stay. I, I never said that out loud, but that, that right. was my mindset. Right. Uh, other places where you know you've got guys staying forever, you know, and maybe like like a wall minor or guys are I I've played ball here. I want a state championship baseball here. I'm committed my brother-in-law goes here you know my kids are gonna go here like then all right now it's time for you to take ownership i'm a temporary guest it's yours you take ownership how do you want me to word this what do you want me to do right as long as i can still remember it um you know yeah then we're good if it's something that like my brain hurts then i'm gonna have to stomp it down a little bit but 
All right. He has to be very instinctual, and you have to be able to spout it off as if it's telling somebody your name, rank, and serial number because the minute you start – Doing the scat man, bebop, a bada boop thing yeah. in front of the kids, yeah. you lose all your credibility. Yeah. Being wrong yeah. in front of them is okay as long as you admit you were wrong. But, well, uh, like that, you know, they're like, you know, they start getting into that. And you know, some of that's your fault if you don't study up what you're supposed to do. So you don't want to be yeah. the guy that doesn't know. I had an assistant coach for me at Cornerstone. He used to carry around a giant notebook that was all laminated up. And it was our kicking game stuff because he was a kicking game guy. And he had no qualms about bringing that notebook out. And as he taught it, he would show them and he would use it almost like being a teacher. And he'd say, this is what it looks like. And he, I have no problems. And then the other side of the notebook was all the defensive stuff. So when he was in his linebacker drill, he would show them on the pages and go through it all. Like, that's great. That's, if that's the method you need. If, what, I and, if it wor- and if it works and gets the results, then uh, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, any... Um, and again, with a focus on maybe upper level youth, you know, middle school level coaches, anything else you would just recommend or suggest if they're going to think about incorporating, you know, RPO concepts into wing T? Um, just one big thing, I guess, was, um, you know, making sure on the back side of that, that the, the tackle does gap hinge. And a lot of wing T offenses, they'll just through block that. Yeah. Um, you can't through block that because you're protecting the quarterback in case he pulled and throws a slant. So you've got to kind of, you know, t- take your jab, step, gap, hinge, and ride mm-hmm. that defense and out of the way on the back side of it because of that. Um, you know, there was the John Gruden quarterback camp with Brad Kaya, and he gets lit up and, you know, knocks his tooth out against Florida State. And the funny thing about that is that that wasn't, it's not like the plays don't work. It's not like, um, well, one second, air conditioning. Ugh. It's not like the plays don't work and stuff like that. It's that I don't know why the scheme wasn't to gap hinge because you have to protect inside out. Right. So avoiding the blitz, especially if you're wing T, you're going to get a lot of the A gap stuff. Um, avoiding that uh, by gap hinging. And, the, and for us, the center always had to be the best offensive lineman we had okay. because okay. he's having to really be the smartest and, and – one of the more athletic, you know, I know that's not common in a wing tee, but when you're stepping back a step um, and you're getting into the timing it takes to make that extra step of a read, mm-hmm. I think he's got pretty dominant and be able to communicate to the other linemen um, and then perform protecting the, the A gap for him. Right. So I guess that's a, that's a good point in that, it's an RPO, you're going to, and let's just say it's belly with the spread, so there's no tight end on that. Like a, It's a weak side belly, but you can run it either way because maybe you're spread out. That, that backside, sorry, that backside tackle then almost has, has to be thinking of that as a package play where he's going to always be thinking about that pass protection um, and yeah. that hinge. Yeah, yeah. and the gap, you know, gap hinge is, is if that's part of your the way that you're doing it, and you're doing it that way all the time, and that's the same way that we block lead. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's a familiar block to him, and we really communicate that. But for us, the through blocks are uh, on option, so it's going to be on um, split zone because the end's getting kicked back anyway. Have that wham block, and then on inside zone read. Um, but on you know on buck sweep. We still gap hinge that backside guy. We don't run up to the second level. You don't, you don't do a cutoff with him. Yeah, right. you might pull and, and throw the slant. He needs that protective. Right. And it, it's a good feel for the quarterback, too. Okay, I know my tackle is staying home. That ends up just coming free to hit me in the chest every yeah. time. And, and on it, honestly, the, the tackles that I've had probably nine of the 11 years I've coached youth, they never, they never get to a cutoff block anyway. On that, they're just, they don't have the speed and agility to weave their way through and actually have an impact on the play. I'd love to have that. My tight ends do sometimes, but not the tackles. And uh, Georgia Tech complains about it. So if those guys are, you know, yeah, getting scholarship money to do it, and they're some of the best athletes in the world, and they can't, and that's yeah. what he complains about a lot is them not getting there. Oh, they didn't get there. So then he weren't really just cutting the backside yeah. and. 
you know, wearing guys down as opposed to running up there. I mean, he complains about not getting there and, you know, um, yeah, and it's just a safety thing. I know some guys call house or they say home and stuff to tell the guy to stay home. Yeah. Um, that's the call when the quarterback is going to throw. He, but then to me, then you're giving away yeah. that you're throwing it. Yeah. So we This year we only had one team pick up on all of our little cheapy nuances. Um, Taft, they picked up on every little nuance, like on power, cutting the guard step down halfway or, you know, his, his um, alignment halfway or, you know um, – certain communicative things that they, they were picking up on. We had our H back cheat up, you know, a yard uh, on split zone to be able to get there a little easier. He's not equal with the quarterback, just some stuff like that. Right. And, uh, they were one of the only teams that picked up on some of our cheapy nuances. Um, and so we just told the kids, stop doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it's still power. Yeah. Let's don't take this, the yeah. cheat anymore. Like, yeah. But um, so yeah, it's, it's not going to get seen. And so I don't think yeah, getting up there is that important. I think it's more important for the kid to gap hinge and not be yelling out home, okay. home, home. And then all of a sudden they go, well, he's throwing. All right. You know, like, you don't want that because with that Houston Cougar thing we were doing, only one team figured that out because we were yelling out something different every time. Mm-hmm. They didn't know what we were really yelling because the same thing happened with two different words. That gotcha. helps. Yeah. But, you know, maybe it was any H word means staying home. So you could yell at anything. You know, that might help. But right. I just thought, hey, why don't we just gap hinge this, make the guy feel safer, give the lineman a block that he knows how to do very well already. Um, through block with, you know, and the zone stuff works a little easier. As far as this, it's a little harder to do. Right. All right. I'm going to stop the recording now. And thank you so much for your your help here.